Good evening. It's Facebook Love Sunday. I know I said yesterday I lost count. I think this is 87. Facebook Love number 87. Started for the pandemic, continuing as we move forward into a new reality because the virus isn't going away and it's going to be a while before we know what to do. Staying home more than I go out, but not feeling that buzz of, of nervousness when I go to the store or anything like that. I feel like I've got a handle on it, so that's good. Hoping you're enjoying this gorgeous weekend. The weather's like crystal. Um, I had a socially distant dinner with a friend last night, and we talked and laughed and visited and told way, way, way a lot of stories. Um, and as we were chatting, I remembered a poet who I really enjoyed that I had sort of put away and forgotten about, not because I didn't um, still love her, but because her books were stored with her novels. Um, her name is Marge Piercy, and she's written many, many novels, but also, I don't know how many books of poetry, but I own four or five of them. And uh, when I was just finishing college and growing into my adult self in my early to mid-twenties, I read everything that she wrote. Um, she is singularly salty. She can be ill-tempered. Uh, I met her, and that was true. Um, I was a little sad that she didn't immediately adore me or something, but, you know, that's something you learn as you're becoming an adult, that not everybody will love you just because, you know, you're so wonderful. Um, I never stopped enjoying her writing because I found her so salty. Uh, and anyway, as I was explaining to my friend what I loved about her writing, I pulled out some of her stuff today and realized that she's affected my own writing even more than I previously believed, though I knew that she had. Um, so I pulled out a few from a book of hers published in 1991. So just as I finished college, this book came out. Um, and there's a few pieces in here. And this one that I'm going to read first is the first one that really um, made such an impression that I never forgot the message of the poem. So this is a piece by Marge Piercy from a collection called My Mother's Body. And this is entitled Putting the Good Things Away. In the drawer were folded fine batiste slips embroidered with scrolls and posies, edged with handmade lace too good for her to wear. Daily, she put on schmatas fit only to wash the car or the windows, rags that had never been pretty, even when new. Somewhere, such dresses are sold only to women without money to waste on themselves or pleasure. To women who hate their bodies, to women whose lives close on them. Such dresses come bleached by tears, packed in salt like herring. Yet she put the good things away for the good day that must surely come when promises would open like tulips, their satin cups, for her to drink the sweet, sacramental wine of fulfillment. The story shone in her as through tinted glass, how the mother gave up and did without, and was in the end crowned with what? Scallions? Crowned queen of the dead place in the heart where old dreams whistle on bone flutes, where runover pets are forgotten, where lost stockings go. In the coffin, she was beautiful, not because of the undertaker's garish cosmetics, but because that face at 80 was still her face at 18,
peering over the drab long dress of poverty, clutching a book. Where did you read your dreams, mother? Because her expression softened from the pucker of disappointment, the grimace of swallowed rage, she looked a white-haired girl. The anger turned inward, the anger turned inward. Where could it go except to make pain? It flowed into me with her milk. Her anger annealed me. I was dipped into the cauldron of boiling rage and rose a warrior and a witch, but still vulnerable there where she held me. She could always wound me for she knew the secret places. She could always touch me for she knew the pressure points of pleasure and pain. Our minds were woven together. I gave her presents and she hid them away, wrapped in plastic. Too good, she said, too good. I'm saving them. So after her death, I sort them. The ugly things that were sufficient for every day and the pretty things for which no day of hers was ever good enough. Putting the Good Things Away by Marge Piercy. I've just never forgotten that poem. Not because my mom is like that, she's not. Um, but I think that if we go back a few generations on either side of my family, there's at least a few women who never had enough. And by the time enough came, had gotten in the habit of thinking that maybe that wasn't for them. And I don't even just mean uh, material things. I mean the idea that joy can belong to us, that we can find happiness and laughter and lightness in the midst of whatever life is dishing out. Because honestly, like, when is it ever peaceful? When is the chaos not there? Um, I spoke a week or so ago about the idea that when I was younger, maybe I just was able to shut out the world more effectively. And now I just can't seem to do it. And so occasionally the trauma overtakes me. Um, but I keep clawing my way back up into joy. Um, so this, this piece uh, of Marge Piercy's really gets me. Um, she's quite a ferocious writer. Um, I recommend all of her poems, even the ver er, all of her old books, even the earliest ones when she wasn't an expert writer. Um, but as she goes along, her writing just gets better and better. By the 80s, she was a master. Um, now here's a piece later in the same collection, which at first might be about pets, but I think as you go along, you will realize uh, it's really about, it's about creation. It's about what we do and what it means. So this is titled, Your Cats Are Your Children. Certain friends come in, they say, your cats are your children. They smile with a great, they smile from a great height on down. Clouds roll in around their hair. I have real children, they mean, while you have imitation. My cats are not my children. I gave Morgan away yesterday to a little boy she liked. I'm not saving to send them to Harvard. When they stay out overnight, I don't call the police. I like the way they don't talk, the way they do, eyes shining or narrowed, tails bannering, paws kneading, cats with private lives and passions sharp as their claws, hunters, lovers, great sulkers. No, my children are my friends, my lover, my dependents on whom I depend, those few for whom I will rise in the night to give comfort, massage, medicine, whose calls I always take. 
My children are my books that I just ate for years. A slow-witted elephant, eternally pregnant. Books that I sit on for eras, like the great auk on a vast marble egg. I raise them with loving care. I groom and educate them. I chastise, reward, and adore. I exercise them lean and fatten them up. I roll them about my mind all night and fuss over them in the mornings. Then they march off into the world to be misunderstood, mistreated, stolen, to be loved for the wrong reasons, to be fondled, beaten, lost. Now and then I get a postcard from Topeka, Kansas, doing just fine. People take them in and devour them. People marry them for love. People write me letters and tell me how they are my children too. I have children whose languages rattle dumbly in my ears like gravel. Children born of the wind that blows through me from the graves of the poor and brave who struggled all their short, throttled lives to free people whose faces they could not imagine. Such are the children of my woods. Your Cats Are Your Children by Marge Piercy. I love the beginning there. Certain friends come in and they say, your cats are your children. Patronizing. Um, I have children and cats, uh, but I think that my creative stuff, including gardening and other projects, feel like children too, writing a book, writing a poem, writing a song, recording it, putting it all together into a finished product. Um, and then you do have no control, just like with your children, none, what they are, where they go. working on projects, thinking about how to do this in the chaos with joy. This is Facebook Love. I'll see you again. Bye-bye.